Good morning, church. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. I am Allison Berry, the pastor, and it's so great to welcome you to our virtual service. I know many of us are getting tired of virtual services, but um, we will continue to do this until we feel like it's safe for us to gather again and just know that Ray, Melanie, and I miss being with all of you and can't wait for the time when we can come back together. So that being said, there are still a lot of things going on in the church. Monday night Zoom Bible study invites anyone who wants to join them for their winter studies on hope. Contact Marsha Bush if you'd like more information on joining their Zoom meeting and her phone numbers in the directory. You can also call the church office. Also, Maybell, Henry, and Judy Linder are looking for more volunteers to work with the gathering in for our additional one or two times a month when we host um, the families during this time of pandemic. Also, a pile of mail was thrown into the bushes along Barton. So mail thieves are back, most likely looking for stimulus checks. So watch your mailboxes if they are unlocked. And a reminder, please drop off any cookies for the gathering in tomorrow from four to six. We need dozens and dozens and people, the guests look forward to these cookies. And the last announcement, Stephen ministers are available every Sunday during January from 9.30 to 10.30 for prayers and private time and you know anything you if you'd like to visit with them they are there to provide confidential time care you know one-on-one -on -one, caring for each other no scheduling just show up with a mask and they do practice physical distancing so that's it for announcements other than we miss you all and hope to see you soon and um I'll keep you updated on when we think we'll be able to gather together for worship Good morning, kiddos. Our story today is the story of the Good Shepherd and World Communion. There once was a man 
who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people wondered who he was. And often they would ask him. Once when they asked him, he answered, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. I can call them by name. They know the sound of my voice. And as I lead, they will follow. They trust me when I lead them out of the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. This is the table of the Good Shepherd. Here is the bread and the wine of the Good Shepherd. Sometimes someone comes in and says the words of the Good Shepherd and gives us the bread and the wine or the juice. The people of the world come to the table. And of course, the children are invited to the table. They come too. Jesus called his disciples to the table. And Jesus calls us. Jesus calls you. You are welcome at the table of the Good Shepherd. God is in the table of the Good Shepherd. And God is in all places and all times. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Lori King. Today's scripture is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Will you please join me in prayer? May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts and the living of this day be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So on the surface, this morning's gospel reading seems pretty straightforward. Jesus asks the disciples to follow him and they drop everything and go with him. In essence, they are called to follow Jesus. However, in this season of Epiphany, we are invited to see beyond what appears on the surface. There is more to this gospel reading than meets the eye. One major difference between Mark's gospel and the gospel of Luke, for instance, is the laconic and reticent nature of the narrator. Mark doesn't feel the need to provide extra details and explanations to events around Jesus. However, in the calling of the disciples in Luke's gospel, there is a miracle that precedes the disciples' decision to follow Jesus. They had been fishing all night and did not catch anything. Jesus tells them to head out to deeper water, and they were astonished by the amount of fish that they caught. Such details are significant if we want to carefully examine the text. Also, the text informs us that Simon and Andrew were casting a net from shore. Such fishing from shore is even more labor-intensive than casting nets from a boat. I have friends in Humboldt County that perform such fishing. They wade in the frigid waters of the Pacific Ocean at night, in the darkness, and then drag nets that are filled with smelt and herring to shore. It is backbreaking, terrifying, and not that lucrative. There are scary things in that water aside from huge waves. James and John, however, fished from a boat. We can presume that they were a little more financially secure than Simon and Andrew. The text informs us that they were preparing nets and left their father with hired men. That being said, Mark suggests that in both instances, the response to Jesus' call to discipleship comes at a cost that is rather shocking and must have been difficult. Simon and Andrew, in order to respond to his call, had to give up their livelihood, their security, their accustomed ways of being in the world. That is no small price. James and John had to give that up and even more. They left their father and their families. And how peculiar is it that Jesus invites them to fish for people? What can that possibly mean? And how do we begin to unpack unpack that metaphor. The image of hooking people conjures up many negative connotations for me. The metaphor reeks of manipulation and deception. What things hook us in our world? Drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, and social media, to name a few. The insidious side of social media is that it aims to gradually, slightly, imperceptibly, change our behavior and perceptions. That is what we do, how we think, 
and how we are. In the context of this morning's gospel reading, how does Jesus hook us and what are the expectations around hooking others? Does Jesus try to manipulate or deceive those around him? Or is there something else going on in this reading? For me, there are two important factors at play here. First, what is it about Jesus that leads others to trust him? Perhaps part of the attraction to Jesus is what some call recognition energy. The disciples recognized in Jesus some aspect of a deep spiritual experience, something authentic that tugged at their souls. Second, recognition energy goes both ways. Jesus seems to have recognized something of value in his disciples. He seems to meet them where they are and speaks to them with words and images that they understand. After all, they're fishermen. If Jesus used that line on me, I would run away screaming in terror. I've gone on commercial fishing boats. It is dangerous, violent, and exhausting. I was traumatized when I went halibut fishing, and in order to bring the halibut on the boat, we had to shoot it in the head. And even on the boat, it was writhing and thrashing and gasping. It was traumatic. Also, there is something so transformative about someone believing in us and seeing potential and possibilities that others may not recognize. I am deeply indebted to the people who have validated me, teachers, mentors, grandparents, and dear friends. Their belief in me, especially at times when I've doubted myself, strengthens me. Such people build us up instead of tearing us down. And notice that Jesus didn't tell the disciples what to do or what to expect. To some, he said, come and see, come and see what is happening around us, not come and hear what I'm going to tell you. To others, he said, follow me. It's important to remember that commercial fishing was under the control of the Roman Empire at that time. Caesar owned all the water and fishing was heavily regulated and taxed. Nearly all fish were exported to the empire, leaving local communities hungry and poor. The people that fished were deprived of food that they caught and food that they harvested. The decision to follow Jesus had other layers of meaning. Leaving their nets behind can also be seen as a form of resistance to empire. By asking the disciples to follow him, Jesus in part Ask them to resist the existing social and economic order, to resist exploitation. The burden of taxation resulted in the loss of land, indentured service to the wealthy, and the breakup of families as people migrated for work. And yet, Simon and Andrew, James and John, left everything to follow Jesus. Is our world all that different? I'm currently reading a book called Death Gap, How Inequality Kills. The parallels between what was happening in Palestine at the time of Jesus and what is happening in our world are astounding. Growing income gaps contribute to widening death gaps, according to the author of this book, who's a doctor in Chicago. How do we abandon disadvantaged communities, asks the author. He says we do this through white flight, that is, when, as white people, when we leave communities, jobs tend to go with us. We do it by withdrawing political support for policies that might lift these neighborhoods from poverty. And we do it by endorsing perceptions that blame these communities for their plight. Simply put, we fail to empathize. Racism fuels segregation, which fuels perceptions about people, which fuels lack of empathy. This creates a very vicious cycle. Policies such as predatory lending and redlining in our cities have a similar effect on people. 
Lack of empathy, he says, kills in three ways. Negative perceptions of poor neighborhoods perpetuate poverty. Wealthy citizens influence policies that support their own interests at the expense of policies that might help out people of poverty. And finally, subset of influential, Ameri of influential Americans withdraw their investment in the common good. He notes that life expectancy in poor neighborhoods can be 69 and it can be 85 in wealthy neighborhoods in the same city. There's a common misperception that violence is the cause of this disparity. It is not. The main cause is lack of health care. In Chicago, for instance, if Hyde Park were a country, life expectancy would be 83 and they would rank second in the world. Washington Park, which is a half a mile away, would rank 141st, tied with Iraq. 14 years of life expectancy evaporate within a half mile. In New Orleans, Navarre, is, the life expectancy is 80 and the French Quarter is 55. In short, the author argues, inequality kills. Community solution to illness caused by poverty or racism requires members of affluent communities to witness the suffering of impoverished communities and to do something about it. We need to support policies that mitigate suffering, even if it comes at our expense. The disciples gave us an example of how to do this. They left behind their nets and their families. They left everything. Is this story in this gospel reading about us or is it about God? How God calls us and creates us as people who are able to follow. Is this also a message of repentance? Jesus says, repent and believe the gospel. Has God broken into the world, shaping us into being people who can give more generously? Jesus calls those around him to reshape their lives. Simon and Andrew, James and John, exchange their old lives for new ones. We can relate to this. How many of us are ready to leave old lives behind for new ones? or find our old lives slipping away from us in this time of pandemic. Do you find ordinary life to be satisfying? Are you searching for more, something different? What would prompt you to abandon your net? When everything is good, we are less likely to leave everything behind. We become complacent and apathetic. Restless peasant fishermen leaving behind their nets are not all that unlike lower castes in India marching hundreds of miles for salt with Gandhi or striking sanitation workers in Memphis in the 1960s. Fishing for people. This is not some evangelical rallying cry to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but it is an act of civil disobedience and action. Jesus' metaphor mixes both a prophetic sense of warning to oppressors and lament of those oppressed by the privatizers of the fishing industry. Jesus summons folks to join him. This was not just good news, but this was great news for the poor. They left their nets this is a sign of liberation, freedom from bondage, and they were called to participate in social and economic redistribution. Call to discipleship is both personal and political. Can it be that the feeding of the multitudes was an act of rebellion against empire? If Rome owned all of the fishing rights, then what does it mean to feed so many people? Is God calling you down a different path? To what life is God calling you? The time is now. It's not tomorrow. It's not next week. 
it's not a year from now. This past year, if anything, has revealed the urgency of this moment. So we repent, and we need to see repentance not as some sort of punishment, but as good news. I changed my life not because I am some sort of depraved creature, but because I seek something different. I don't want a world of starving and hungry people. I want a world where justice prevails. When the disciples are called, they're not checked. They're not asked to check their minds at the doors. They're called to magnify all that is good and all that is noble in them. If we're going to follow Jesus, we need to do so in the fabric and in the context of our lives, our communities, and our cultures. God wants our skills, our talents, and gifts, and wants to magnify them. So church, I'll start with some of the joys in our community right now. Um, Big joy. The Llewellyns now have their fifth great-grandchild. So they are certainly ecstatic about that. So for the joy of babies, new grandbabies, new great-grandbabies, we say thanks be to God. And also, I'd like to... um, Just acknowledge all the good things that this church is doing, the willingness to pick up extra time with gathering in, all the volunteers who give each week working for the food pantry, and um, there are just so many things going on around here and such generosity. The Senior Life Center has been providing food, and um, this church continues to just... um, reach out and find ways of connecting and it is just so wonderful to see all these connections as the pastor. So for these joys we say thanks be to God. Some concerns right now. So we're asking for healing prayers for Molly Leach, Reverend Melanie's daughter. A freak accident in the yard caused Um, structural damage and ligament damage in the knee so she's starting physical therapy they're hoping they won't have to do surgery but uh, if we can keep Molly in our prayers and also um, Gemma Goebel continues to heal from complications from her recent tonsillectomy so also Bronwyn Manzer's recovering from post-COVID syndrome and um, is just really having a hard time right now and Peg Hall has been moved back to her residence, but is still in need of healing prayers. And Barbara Llewellyn and Kay Berriman, who are recovering at home from injuries, certainly need uh, prayers of healing. And finally, continued prayers of healing for Christine, Carol and June, Neelai's daughter. So for all these concerns, we lift our concern to the Lord, Lord hear our prayers. And also, Claire Camp and her family need prayers for the recent loss of their relative, Dick, who had cancer. So for Claire Camp and her, her family, we lift our concern to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayers. Let us continue in prayer. 
Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity to find ways of service, both serving um, our church members, serving our community at large. We ask our, for prayers for all those who are suffering in this pandemic, whether they're suffering financially, emotionally, physically, um, there are just so many families that are hurting right now and so many people who are unable to be with loved ones because of this pandemic. We also pray for all those folks on the front lines. We pray for the folks that are struggling to pay rent or feed their families. We, we ask for prayers for all the folks that come to our food pantry looking for food and a little extra support. But Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all the blessings of each and every day. We thank you that um, there seems to be so far a peaceful transition to, uh, of power in our country. And we continue to pray for peace, reconciliation, and just the ability to understand and listen to each other. May peace prevail, not just in our hearts, but in our world. We also thank you that we have so many generous and kind and loving people in this church who are willing to not just give financially, but give of themselves to go out and help others to find ways of staying connected in such isolating times. And now, as a community of faith, let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. Amen. <laughs>